Hey, you guys, welcome back. Thank you for being here. I super appreciate you. If you know who I am, wonderful. If not, my name is Madeline Klein, and I talk about all things Canadian true crime, missing persons, mystery, and history. A couple months ago, I talked about the Shell Lake massacre that happened in Shell Lake, Saskatchewan, where nine members of the Peterson family were all brutally murdered inside their home. I'll link that video below, but somebody commented on my TikTok video and asked me if I had ever heard about the P. Durson family, with a D, from Buffalo Narrows, Saskatchewan, who were also slaughtered inside their home just 17 months after the Shell Lake Massacre. I couldn't believe such a horrific event happened not once, but twice in little old Saskatchewan, and to families with such similar last names. There is no relation to these cases, they are not linked at all, but there are super eerie similarities to them. It starts in the early morning hours of January 30th, 1969 in Buffalo Narrows, Saskatchewan. Buffalo Narrows is a small town in northern Saskatchewan, about 350 kilometers away from Shell Lake, so a four hour drive, give or take, depending on who's driving. At the time, the population would have been between 500 and 700 people, and it's a very remote location. There was exactly one road in and out of town, and it was not maintained over winter. So during the winter months, you had to fly in and out. So it's January 30th, minus 40 below in the middle of the night, 19-year-old Frederick McCallum breaks into the Peterson home by breaking a window and unlocking the door. The timeline is a little unclear, but Frederick enters the house with a large axe and slaughters six members of the Peterson family and a family friend sleeping in the living room. 32-year-old Thomas Peterson and his wife, 30-year-old Bernadette, were found in their bedroom. A family friend, 48-year-old Jean-Baptiste Herman, was sleeping in the living room, and five out of the seven Peterson children were sleeping in the second bedroom. Sisters Connie and Cynthia were sleeping at their grandmother's that night, leaving only five of the children home. The order in which the family was murdered is unknown, but nobody fought back and everybody remained in their beds, mutilated from the neck up. It's said that Fred spent a considerable amount of time with each victim. Fred would say he doesn't remember committing this heinous act, that he came to in the blood-covered Peterson home and thought that somebody else had committed the murders. It wasn't until he caught a reflection of himself covered in blood did he know what he did. He left the Peterson home and went to the neighbor's, which was coincidentally his aunt's house, small town. Fred's 15-year-old cousin opened the door and let him in. Fred told his family he just murdered a bunch of people and showed them the blood on him as proof. Fred then calls the local priest and tells him that he murdered people and he needs him to come right away to perform last rites on the children. The priest didn't believe Fred at first because he sounded intoxicated, but after a second phone call insisting this was a real emergency, the priest got up and went to the Peterson home where he confirmed what Fred had told him. When he arrived, there were numerous mutilated bodies inside the home. They found the three adults, Thomas, Bernadette, and Jean, and in the children's bedroom, they found eight-year-old Grace Ann, five-year-old Tommy, four-year-old Richard, and two-year-old Rhoda. If you're paying attention, I said there were five children in the bedroom, but I only named four. That's because when they shined a flashlight into the children's bedroom, Lone survivor, seven-year-old Donnie, sat up in his bed. Donnie was rushed to the hospital with critical head injuries, as well as his mother, Bernadette, who must have been showing slight signs of life. Donnie would be admitted and stabilized and eventually make a full and miraculous recovery. Bernadette unfortunately succumbed to her injuries about four hours later. So the priest is the one that contacts the RCMP. Police arrive to the neighbor's house at about 3.20 a.m. to arrest Fred and find him sitting at the table having a cup of tea. When they tell Fred that he's under arrest for murder, he replies with a simple and cold, I killed them, so what? When he's in the back of the cop car, Fred tells police, I didn't kill them all, there are three still alive. He also threatens the Mounties and says, I was going to get you with an axe tonight too. I'll kill you when I'm out. And it's also alleged he said he hopes he gets the electric chair. A little bit about Frederick McCallum. He grew up in a quite dysfunctional home in Buffalo Narrows with his alcoholic mother and eight half-siblings. At 11 years old, he'd be removed from his home and placed into foster care where he would move from foster home to foster home. 
He was moved around, but always stayed in or around Buffalo Narrows. By 16, he spent some time in jail for minor crimes, and it would be in prison that he would start to hear voices and hallucinate. When he listened to the radio, he thought that they were talking to him or about him. There's not much else about the history of Fred McCallum, and I think that's largely due to the publication ban on this case. The trial was delayed many times for continued psychiatric testing, but in the end, Frederick McCallum would be found fit to stand trial. He was originally being charged with seven counts of non-capital murder, but somewhere along the way, five of those counts were dropped, and he was only being charged for the murders of the two adult men. I have no idea why this happened, but the same thing happened with the murderer from the Shell Lake Massacre. 21-year-old Victor Hoffman killed nine members of the Peterson family, two parents, and seven children, but was only charged for the murder of the parents. Why? The 60s were a wild time. Anyway, by the time the trial rolled around, then eight-year-old Donnie had made a full recovery and testified. When asked what happened the night in question, he simply said, I got chopped. When they asked who did it, he called Fred by his nickname, Benny. Fred, or Benny, was known to the Peterson family and was actually at the house just two nights before. There was said to be a gathering or a party, and at one point in the night there was a dispute between Fred and Tommy and Bernadette over alcohol. There's reports Bernadette kicked him out of the house, but then there's other reports that said she just pushed him out of the room that they were in. But regardless, there was an argument. The court heard from a doctor who interviewed Fred McCallum many times, and during some of these interviews, McCallum was given sodium pentothal, which is also called truth serum. That's not a completely correct description though, because this drug doesn't magically just make you tell the truth. Sodium pentothal makes it so that the brain can't form new deceptions or lies. But you can remember and reiterate previous lies you have formed. During these sessions under sodium pentothal, Fred talked about how he had thought about murder for a couple years prior, how much he hated Mounties and wanted to kill them originally and make them suffer. He would also talk about the trans-like state he was in when he came to in the Peterson house. He said it was like a dream or like he was in a daze. The doctor would tell the court he believed Fred was suffering from schizophrenia. Which, what happened in the Peterson home, is like textbook schizophrenic episode. The all-male, all-white jury took only four and a half hours to reach their verdict. Not criminally responsible. Or not guilty by reason of insanity. Frederick McCallum would be sent to the Prince Albert Penitentiary for a brief time in 1970, before he was transferred to Oak Ridge in Penetanguishene, Ontario. I'm going to link all the videos I've done that Oak Ridge comes up in. There's a few of them. Oak Ridge was a maximum security facility for the criminally insane, and you would not believe the shit that went down there. But that's for another day. Fred flew under the radar until his release in 1989 with the condition he not returned to Saskatchewan. The surviving victims of this brutal massacre would face a lifetime of hardship. Donnie, the lone surviving son, would struggle most of his life. He was vengeful of McCallum and believed he was in the PA pen. Donnie would spend a lot of his life committing crimes in attempt to be put into jail with McCallum to confront him. And like, I, can you blame him? The two never crossed paths. McCallum would have already been in Oak Ridge by this time. In 1987, at just 26 years old, Donnie would have his life cut tragically short getting hit by a car. Donnie, his sister Cynthia, and one of their uncles were driving along a road in Buffalo Narrows. An oncoming car got too close and swiped the driver's side mirror off, so the three of them pulled over, and when Donnie was assessing the damage, another car came up and I guess didn't see him, hit him, threw him 30 feet, and he died. Like this poor family. There was very little community support shown to the surviving children of the Peterson family. They were offered no counseling, no therapy, nothing. They weren't even informed about the whereabouts of their family's murderer, ever. They were never notified he left the province and surely not notified upon his release. They were and continue to be kept completely in the dark. Fred McCallum is a free man and I cannot find anything about him. He may have changed his name, who knows? There was a condition of release that he not return to Saskatchewan, 
but something tells me that they're not very vigilant on enforcing these rules. I know that back in the day, if you were found not criminally responsible or not guilty by reason of insanity, you could, after X amount of years, apply for a pardon and end up getting your record completely wiped clean. This is what happens in the case of Peter Woodcock. Another inmate had been found not guilty by reason of insanity, did his time, got out, applied for the pardon, got it, and got his record wiped clean. Because this man had no criminal record, he could sign other Oak Ridge inmates out on day passes. This happened and another man got murdered, so there's that. I'll link that video below. I understand that some people can be rehabilitated and you can't lock everybody up forever, but you'd think that the bare minimum would be to keep tabs on the man capable of mass murder when unmedicated. And maybe letting the surviving victims know what's going on. But that's pretty much where it ends. If Fred McCallum is alive, I can't find a single thing about him on the internet. It's believed that he's in Ontario, but that's unconfirmed and just speculated. It's crazy how similar this case and the Shell Lake case are, even though they're not connected at all. Both happened in small town Saskatchewan in a two bedroom home, one surviving child, Peterson with a T, Peterson with a D. A young man was found not criminally responsible, diagnosed with schizophrenia and sent off to Oak Ridge. It's a little weird. Jordan from the Nighttime Podcast and I just talked about this case on our series Canadian Gothic. I'll link that episode below. You can also catch us every Thursday night live from the Nighttime Podcast YouTube channel. I'll have that tagged below. Go subscribe. I'll link all of my episodes where the murderer goes to Oak Ridge at one point. Spoiler alert, there's like three or four. And as always, I'll have my link tree linked. If you feel moved to like, subscribe, comment, whatever, you can find all of my content there. But I think that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I always look forward to Tuesday. Come back real soon, like next week. Okay, I really just need to get out of here. I never know how to end these things. Bye.